Yeah, so I think we should really start, ladies and gentlemen. Um, next session on drug delivery and nanomedicine related uh, projects funded by the European Research Council, the ERC. What we try to do is get a good mix of young and old, or I should actually say young and experienced scientists that are uh, working on starting consolidator and uh, advanced ERC grants. And what we'll try to do is deliver lectures which, which show part of the idea and the original, let's say, presentation for the ERC defense of the, of the projects, plus some of the scientific progress that is, that is coming out of these projects. And at the end, also some suggestions and advice for people that are considering to apply for these types of grants. So I hope you enjoy the session and consider it useful. We won't have the official complete discussion at the end, but I would like to have some individual discussions after the individual talks. Please join in in the discussion. And the first speaker is uh, Patrick Couvreur from the University of Paris, who will give a, a keynote lecture in the session on uh, squalino, it's a very difficult word, squalinoilation. Oh, thank you, yes. <laughs> Patrick, please. So first of all, thank you very much uh, to uh, Beat for inviting me to give this uh, very rapid overview of uh, what I am doing in the context of an advanced ERC grant uh, on this qualenolation as a new concept for the uh, drug delivery as uh, nanomedicine. So we have heard today, yesterday, etc., etc., and I hope you are convinced that there are impressive progresses which have been made in the design of targeted uh, nanomedicine. But we have to admit, uh, as you can see here, that only few nanomedicines are actually on the market or even in third-phase clinical uh, uh, trials. And this is due uh, mainly to two major limitations. The first one is a birth release, because as you know, of course, a significant proportion of the drug molecule will be just absorbed at the surface of the nanomedicine rather than really encapsulated into the core of the nanotechnology. And the result of that is that after intravenous administration, you will get an immediate release of this fraction of the drug which is at the surface of the nanoparticles leading to the so-called burst release. But the second limitation, which is uh, probably still more important, is the drug loading. This means the milligram of drug of biologically uh, active molecule per milligram of drug transporter material expressed as a percentage. As you know, with the classical encapsulation technology, you have around a few percent of drug encapsulation. And uh, this is limiting because either you will never reach a sufficient concentration of the drug at the level of the diseased area of the, of, of the body, or if you are increasing the amount of the drug, if you are injecting, for instance, one milligram more of the drug, you will have to inject uh, 20 milligram or 100 milligram more of the transporter material. And you will immediately face a toxicological problem because, as you know, all the nanomedicine, nanotechnology, etc., etc., are going inside the uh, cells. And in this context, we have developed the so called squalenoilation uh, uh, technology. And in fact, the idea was to move from the physical encapsulation paradigm to the chemical encapsulation paradigm. So the idea was to improve the drug loading, we have just to couple chemically the drug with one molecule of the drug with one molecule of the transporter material. Then you will be sure that each molecule of the transporter material will bear one molecule of the drug. And because you have a chemical linkage, of course you have no burst release and you can manage the link so that the drug will be released in the good area of the body. So the problem was to find a transporter and we used the squalene. Why the squalene? Because you know that the squalene, we have everybody uh, a squalene in our body at the level of the skin especially. And in fact, the squalene is a natural and biocompatible uh, uh, lipid, uh, which is in fact a precursor uh, in the human and in the mammalian of the biosynthesis of the cholesterol. 
and to be transformed into lanosterol and then into cholesterol, you can see that the squalene has in fact here to adopt a dynamically folded conformation to be able to enter into the uh, uh, pocket of the oxidosqualene cyclase. And we have taken advantage of this condensed, compact molecular conformation of the squalene to link, as you can see here, to the squalene a lot of different uh, molecules, anti-cancer drugs, antivirals, antibiotics, also anti-cancer siRNA. And you can calculate, uh, depending of course of the molecular weight of the transporter material, the squalene, and the molecular weight of the drug, for instance, the gemcitabine, that the drug loading is, for instance, for gemcitabine squalene of 40%, for the doxorubicin squalene of uh, uh, 58%, and if you are moving to siRNA uh, linked to the squalene, you get uh, as high as 92% of drug loading. And also, as you can see here, for instance, with the gemcitabine squalene, you have an amine bond. And you know that, uh, in fact, this linkage is hydrolyzed by the catepsin B and D intracellularly, which are hyper-expressed into cancer cells. And so in that way, you are avoiding the burst release, and you will release the gemcitabine intracellularly, in majority, into the uh, uh, cancer cells. Now, I would like to illustrate that by a few examples of this technology. First of all, here, as you can see, we coupled the uh, squalene here uh, through an ester bond with the doxorubicin. And we were um, uh, really amazed to see that after putting this bioconjugate into water, we get, as you can see here, nanoparticles, but with an elongated structure that we call nanospaghetti because we have an Italian woman who is doing his PhD in this field. <laughs> and you can see here by cryotem the elongated structure that was confirmed, as you can see here, by transmission electron microscopy. And very amazingly, as you can see here, after intravenous administration of those gemcitabine, uh, of those doxorubicin squalene nanoparticles, uh, all through those nanoparticles are not pegylated, we get long circulating uh, pharmacokinetic profiles comparatively, as you can see here, after the administration of the doxorubicin as a free drug. And this was explained, as you can see here, because when you are injecting those elongated nanostructures of doxorubicin squalene into the bloodstream, you can see very clearly that uh, theoretically, physically, those nanotechnologies are extended by the flow along the streamline because of the blood flow. And for that reason, probably that those uh, uh, elongated nanoparticles are not recognized by the Kupfer cells of the liver. And this may explain that you have long circulating nanoparticles. My pointer is, is killed uh, here. Uh, long circulating nanoparticles, and also you have a very strong decrease in the urinary excretion. And what is interesting, as you know, the major toxicity profile of doxorubicin is a cardiac toxicity, which is a really uh, limiting uh, 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 toxicological uh, uh, side effect. And uh, after administration of doxorubicin as squalenolated nanoparticles, you decreased very importantly the concentration of doxorubicin at the level of the cardiac tissue comparatively to what happened with the doxorubicin as a free drug. And after 24 hours, there was an increase in the concentration in the target tissue, which is the tumor. And the result of that, uh, as you can see here, is that on two models of uh, human pancreatic uh, uh, Miapaca experimental cancer and a murine uh, uh, lung, lung uh, adenocarcinoma. You can see here the uh, growth of the tumor of the untreated animals. In red, you have the growth of the tumor of the animals treated with the doxorubicin as a free drug. You can see that it is a, a resistant uh, 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 model to the uh, treatment with doxorubicin. And after injection of the uh, uh, doxorubicin 
uh, squalene nanoparticles in green, you can see in both models that you completely stopped the evolution of the tumor. And of course, this was confirmed by immunohistochemistry. You can see that the uh, nanoparticulate formulation induced a higher apoptosis through the caspas 3 uh, pathway and a decreased expression of the KE67 uh, uh, antigen, which is an antigen expressed in the cells which are in a, a, a proliferation. But an important shape uh, of uh, face of the medal is, of course, the toxicological aspect that we investigated on the model of the hypertensive uh, uh, rats. And what we did was to inject each week one milligram per kilo body weight of doxorubicin as a free drug. And you can see very clearly that after 11 weeks, you have a very strong modification of the histology of the, of the, uh, uh, of the cardiac tissue. You can see here a lot of vacuolization because of the toxicity of the doxorubicin. And also there was a huge increase in the blood uh, troponin, which is a marker also of the cardiac toxicity. And also you can see that there was, as you can see here, by the diminution of the uh, body weight and the diminution of the food consumption, there was also an intestinal toxicity due to the treatment with doxorubicin. So with doxorubicin squalene nanoparticles at a single dose of one milligram per kilo body weight equivalent doxorubicin, and with a double dose, you can see that there was no modification of the uh, histology of the uh, cardiac tissue after taking a biopsy of the animals, and there was also no modification, as you can see here, on the level of the level of the troponin uh, comparatively to the untreated animal. So you can see that we had a better activity and a lower toxicity. So now what you can do also, and this is another example, is that you can still improve the technology by using now two drugs which will act on two different biological targets in the field of the cancer again. Here we have used another bioconjugate of squalene, which is the gemcitabine squalene, the gemcitabine here in red, coupled with a squalene, and when you are putting this bioconjugate into water, you get also a nano, uh, a, a nanoparticles of around uh, 100 nanometers. And then we used the iso, uh, isocombretastatin, which is not water-soluble, but soluble in the uh, squalene medium, so that it was very easy to solubilize this isocombretastatin together with the gemcitabine squalene into the same nanoparticle to get a multidrug approach. Why a multidrug approach? Because, in fact, as you know, the gemcitabine squalene will play the game directly into the cancer cells, whereas the isocombretastatin, as you can see here, uh, will, of course, uh, it's an anti-angiogenic compound which will destroy or modify the vascular endothelium at the level of the tumor. And uh, in a few words, it is uh, quite well uh, working. Again, you can see here, here it is a colon cancer uh, model. You can see here the increase of the tumor volume in uh, uh, black for the untreated animal. We did, of course, a lot of controls that you can see here, which is the gemcitabine squalene nanoparticles plus the isocombrestatin free, the isocombrestatin free uh, plus the gemcitabine free, etc., etc. And you can see that in red, only the uh, multidrug nanoparticles, this means with the isocombretastatin and the gemcitabine squalene together in the same nanotechnology, was able to significantly inhibit the tumor growth volume. And I will not enter into great details, but we did uh, a, a deep uh, pharmaco pharmacokinetic and biodistribution uh, investigation. And in fact, we observed that the level of the tumor, we had an increased concentration of the two drugs and we get a synergistic uh, effect. Now, I will move by using the same squalene technology to the possibility to develop, uh, in fact, stimuli responsive uh, nano device. This means uh, the possibility to have a 
on and off uh, a bottom to uh, have a non-demand spatio-temporal drug release. And uh, uh, so this type of stimuli-responsive nanodevice can respond, as you can see here, either to endogenous stimuli, like for instance the pH, or exogenous stimuli like the magnetic field, and I will show you two examples with an endogenous stimulus and an exogenous stimulus using uh, the same uh, uh, squalene technology. Now, I move now from the field of the cancer to the field of uh, other very important disease, which are resistant intracellular infections. So, as you know, probably when you have an infection, normally the macrophages are, of course, engulfing the bacteria, and the bacteria are uh, uh, usually uh, degraded intracellularly into the cells, uh, lysosomes, because of the enzymes, the pH, etc., etc. The problem is that when you have an immunodepressed situation, instead of being killed by the macrophages, in fact, the bacteria will multiplicate intracellularly, kill the macrophage, escape the macrophage, and enter into other macrophage, and then you have a resistant intracellular infection because most of the antibiotics, like for instance penicillin, are unable to diffuse intracellularly at the level of those infected intracellular sanctuaries. Uh, if you are taking clindamycin, for instance, this antibiotic is diffusing very well intracellularly, but also very rapidly extracellularly. So you never have a sufficient concentration into the lysosomes. And the idea was to uh, use, again, uh, uh, nanotechnologies, which will be engulfed by the macrophage, uh, uh, being finally in the same intracellular compartments than the bacteria, because the phagocytosis is doing by the same way than with the uh, uh, bacteria. And what we did, as you can see here, was to link the squalene with the penicillin, but by using a hydrolyzable a pH sensitive bonds. This means that the drug will be released only into the lysosomes and you see that we get very nice nanoparticles. So it is working very well. You can see here a macrophage which is infected by Staphylococcus aureus. Intracellularly you can see very clearly the punctuated uh, bacteria and by using just a kit we can distinguish between the living bacteria, which are in green, and the dead bacteria, which are in red. You can see that this macrophage is not doing the job. If you are treating those macrophages infected by, by uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus by penicillin as a free drug, you can see that the penicillin, which is very, very active against Staphylococcus aureus, you can see that the penicillin is not killing the intracellular bacteria uh, because of a poor diffusing, uh, diffusion into those intracellular sanctuaries. And now if you are treating uh, those infected macrophages with penicillin G squalene nanoparticles, you can see that you will kill, in fact, after measuring the colony formation units, 99.99% of the intracellular bacteria. Now, another example of uh, stimulus-responsive uh, uh, nanodevice, but stimulus-responsive to an uh, uh, extracorporeal magnetic field to get magnetically guided nanoparticles. In fact, what we did, uh, as you can see here, we used small iron oxide uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, that you can see here in uh, in, uh, in uh, dark in uh, black, and we nanodeposited at the surface of those nanoparticles the gemcitabine squalene bioconjugate. And uh, uh, you know that those uh, uh, magnetized nanoparticles are, of course, sensitive to an extracorporeal magnetic field, and this is the reason why we focused the magnetic field at the level of the tumor. And what we did here, you can see just uh, L12 TEM, uh, L12 -tem uh, leukemia model, which is grafted subcutaneously this time. And we used a dose of gemcitabine of 5 milligrams per kilo body weight, which is a very, very low 
uh, dose of gemcitabine. Generally, in this model, we are using 100 milligram per kilo body weight. So you can see uh, it's not uh, uh, it's a very low dose, a low dose. It's not homeopathy, but it is a very low dose. And you can see here the evolution of the tumor of the untreated animals. When you are treating the animals with the gemcitabine as a free drug, at this dose of 5 mg per kilo body weight, you have no activity. Now, you can see here with a triangle that when you are treating the animals with the gemcitabine squalene nanoparticles, but without extracorporeal magnetic fields, you can see that very clearly that you have an inhibition of the tumor growth, but after 20 days, you can see that there is still an increase in the tumor volume if you didn't uh, inject again uh, those animals with the same uh, uh, therapy. And now, if you are using the uh, nanocomposite nanoparticles at the dose of 5 mg per kilo body weight of gemcitabine squalene and focusing a magnetic field at the level of the tumor, you can see very clearly that you completely inhibit the tumor growth. And what is interesting is that you know that the iron oxide nanoparticles are decreasing the T2 signal at MRI. So we can look here, we can have an image of a sagittal uh, uh, slides, as you can see here, of the animal. You can focus on the tumor and you can see very clearly the size of the tumor when the animals were treated with the nanocomposite nanoparticles, but without the magnetic field, which corresponds here at 20 days to a significant volume of the tumor. Now, if you are putting the magnetic field, you can see that you have a shrinkage of the tumor, and you can also follow the biodistribution of the nanoparticles that you can see here, uh, corresponding to those uh, dark points, which is uh, the single aggregation of the iron oxide nanoparticles, as you can see here also, into the vascular uh, uh, space of uh, the tumor. And this is a concept that was discussed already yesterday and today of the uh, nanoterranostic, because in the same nanotechnology, you are combining both a therapeutic uh, a functionality due to the gemcitabine squalene and an imaging functionality, which is due to the iron oxide uh, nanoparticles. Now, just to uh, show you that you know that in the nature you have thousands and thousands of different terpenes, and squalene is only one terpen. So uh, we were interested to look if it is possible to apply this concept by using other terpenes than squalene and to adapt the nature of the physical chemistry of the terpen to the nature of the uh, targeted or uh, transporter, transporter drug. And uh, we developed uh, uh, recently a, a, a new way to make uh, the polymerization of polyisoprene, of polyterpen, by using the drug, as you can see here, as a start of the polymerization process. This is a so-called nitroxide-mediated uh, uh, polymerization. In fact, what are we doing? We are using gemcitabine. We are uh, uh, linking to gemcitabine an alkoxiamine, and the gemcitabine with the alkoxiamine will induce the polymerization of the polyisoprene of the polyterpene. And this is interesting because depending on the uh, uh, condition for the polymerization, you can perfectly control the length, as you can see here, of the polymer. And you can look, if you have nanoparticles, what is the supramolecular organization of those nanoparticles, if they are lamellar phase or hexagonal phase or cubic phase, etc., etc., and then to have the relationship with the in vivo activity, but I have no time now to enter into those uh, uh, details. So I come to my conclusion. I am on time. So you can see that moving from the paradigm of the physical encapsulation, which is what is used generally in all uh, fields of the uh, uh, nanomedicine for drug encapsulation, to the paradigm of the chemical encapsulation, this allows to increase the drug loading, to design nanoparticles with different shapes, as you have seen with uh, doxorubicin squalene, we have nanospaghetti. With gemcitabine squalene, we have perfect spheres. It is possible to control the drug release through the chemical linker, 
for instance, if you are using an amide bond, to design stimuli responsive nano device, uh, responsive to an endogenous stimulus or to an exogenous stimulus, and to construct multi drug nanoparticles with lower toxicity, better activity, and especially with the possibility to overcome uh, some mechanism of resistance. So before to, to leave the podium, I would like to say, because you asked me to deliver a message, so I think that for an ERC, uh, please take your time. This is very important. I think that uh, uh, if you are uh, uh, answering uh, to the uh, uh, application of the grant uh, very soon uh, and you have no time to think very deeply uh, uh, to your project, it will not work. Maturation is the major word uh, to have a chance to have a, a breakthrough, breakthrough uh, approach and to convince I would say the panel that your project is, uh, is really a breakthrough project, well uh, believed that uh, it is risky, of course, ambitious, but feasible depending on, on your curriculum vitae. So I would like to acknowledge, of course, all the people who collaborate uh, with me with this, uh, 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 with this uh, project, with this ERC project, and we have created a company which is called MedSqual to make the valorization of this uh, technology. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. It was a beautiful lecture. I'm sure there will be questions. Terry, please. Uh, this seems like a very nice platform for technology for a variety of applications. I have a comment and a question. My comment is that the burst phenomenon, burst release phenomenon you described in the beginning is by no means universal for all nanomedicine drugs because uh, the remote loaded uh, formulations like Doxel don't, ex don't show this kind of burst release. My question is... Um, yes, I agree to answer the first question. You have some technology uh, without burst release, but when you are looking to the literature and to the major uh, uh, nanomedicine and to the release profiles, you see that in 99% of the case you have uh, a burst release. Um, my, my question is, did you, um, because, because Doxel is the gold standard right now formulation for doxorubicin, I wonder if you actually compared your squalene doxorubicin against Doxel to see which one performed better? Yes, uh, we did it. Uh, it was on one of my slides, ah, but uh, I have no access uh, now to my slides back. Uh, we did it with the doxorubicin uh, squalene and the uh, reviewer of the uh, PNIS paper asked to compare with Kylix and with Doxil. And we used uh, the maximal we had, in fact, a much lower toxicity uh, with the doxorubicin squalene than with doxil. So we compared at the maximal tolerable dose, and at this dosage, we were much more efficient on those two preclinical models that we, that we have tested. More questions? Um, okay. uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, the... Very Go ahead. A very interesting lecture. Um, Thank you. You didn't describe the phases uh, you achieved. Were these micelles emulsion-like uh, or in solid nature? Did you see any phase transitions depending on the conjugation? Yeah, yeah. This is, a, of course, I had no time to, 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 invest, to speak about that. In fact, it is very easy. We are dissolving, for instance, the doxorubicin squalene or the uh, gemcitabine squalene or the penicillin squalene in uh, uh, a small amount of ethanol and then you are putting this solution in water and the nanoparticle form uh, the nanoassemblies form sp spontaneously what is really amazing is that in general the size of the nanoparticles is around 100 and 150 nanometers but the supramolecular organization is not the same for instance, with the gemcitabine squalene, we did that by uh, X-ray diffraction at small angle scattering. Uh, with the gemcitabine squalene, we have inverted hexagonal phase. With the adenosine squalene, we have, and the DDI, DDC squalene, we have cubic phase. With the penicillin squalene, we have no phase. And we did a correlation between 
the supramolecular organization, for, from that point of view, the physical chemistry is very important, and the pharmacological activity. For instance, with the gemcitabine squalane, hexagonal inverted hexagonal phase, this means you have a lot of water in the, in the, in the nanostructure, you have an excellent anti-cancer activity because the enzymes probably are able to enter in deep into the particle to cleave the linkage and to release the gemcitabine in a good way. But what we did also is the linkage of taxol with squalene. And then we have no anti-cancer activity. But we have also no supramolecular organization. And it is believed that because squalene is a very lipophilic molecule, uh, paclitaxel is a highly uh, lipophilic molecule too. The particles is much too lipophilic. The enzymes are unable to cleave the bioconjugate, especially, especially because we did the linkage with the OH group in two prime position, which is a pharmacophore. And for that reason, probably that uh, uh, we lose uh, all the uh, uh, anti-cancer activity with, uh, with uh, paclitaxel uh, squalene. So you see the supramolecular organization is indeed is very, very important. Okay, last question. Short question, um, short answer. Um, I have a question. Thank you so much for the exciting talk. Ah, okay. Uh, my <laughs> question you. is regarding the uh, magnetic um, particles. Um, do you ever see this having any chance of being translated into the clinic? I kind of find it hard to see a patient being stuck in a, God knows how big of a magnet to deliver some particles to the tumor. I don't yes, see yes, practice. you know that Thank in you. general, I am not speaking only about the uh, uh, squalene uh, iron oxide nanoparticles, but in general, the problem of, of this approach is that, of course, you are able uh, uh, to uh, induce either a hyperthermia or a drug release uh, to uh, a tumor which is uh, externally available for the magnetic field, etc., because you know that the uh, magnetic field to, uh, is not going sufficiently deep into the tissue. So it is uh, an important limitation of all the approaches using uh, an extracorporeal magnetic field. Anyway, then you will tell me, okay, but you have a tumor, uh, the tumor is accessible, we can uh, uh, do the surgery. This is true, but you have some exceptions. For instance, in the field of the uh, brain glioma, where the surgery sometimes is not so easy to do, depending on the localization. And also you have some tumors which are hypervascularized, and uh, uh, you have a very, very big risk after surgical ablation of a uh, uh, strong hemorrhagia, which can be fatal. And in the case of this niche, uh, uh, this approach could be interesting. But I agree that the generalization is probably overwhelmed.